Well, I want to welcome you all to today's OCB webinar. For those who don't know me, my name is Heather Benway, and I manage the OCB Project Office, which is hosted by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. It looks like we're still waiting for a couple more people to submit their responses, so I will get started here in a second. Three more seconds. There we go. All right. Back to it. <laughs> Thank you all for putting those responses in. We really like to, to track participation in the webinar. Anyway, my name is Heather Benway and I manage the OCB project office, which is hosted by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I would like to acknowledge the sustained support of NSF and NASA that makes the OCB program possible. Today, we're joined by Julie Granger from the University of Connecticut. She's a member of the OCB Scientific Steering Committee, who's serving as my webinar co-host. To give you a sense of the breadth of OCB, these green icons depict the overarching science areas. And you can find more specific research questions about OCB on our website. Um, these are this is really a community driven program. So these questions are always evolving in response to community needs and priorities. But just check out the about us tab under the on the OCB website and you can learn a lot more about specifics of these science areas. Just to give you a sneak peek, you can find the schedule and details of this webinar series on our website. Um, here's a sneak peek of the next webinar, which actually falls on election day in the United States. So please get out and vote. Um, OCB webinars typically have topical themes with two speakers per webinar. And then to broaden access, all the webinars are recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. We share registration links for each webinar at the URL listed here and also on our e-newsletter and on Twitter. We're currently accepting applications from the OCB community to give talks in the webinar series. If you go to our website to submit an abstract, and I'll also post a direct link to the submission form in the chat during today's webinar. We are also working with the SSC and OCB community members to plan several thematic webinars. Um, this includes one coming up on exports, um, just to give a sense of what's going on in the planning and execution of the exports field program. Um, and also we will feature a few brief snippets, five minute snippets from NASA and NSF funded PIs and their projects um, that have been part of the exports program. We are looking at a webinar on extreme events in the carbon cycle, featuring both um, hurricanes, tropical storms, and also wildfires and how they impact carbon and nutrient transport across the aquatic continuum. We're going to have a webinar on global ocean biological sampling program. Um, it will fe feature a couple of speakers um, about how we can establish a program like this and what the scientific benefits of that would be. And we're going to hopefully have a panel style webinar on advancing the next generation of oceanographers equitably. Um, this will be a, a really interesting panel discussion um, to, to focus on sharing experiences and identifying actions to better support early career members of minoritized groups entering the field of oceanography. Um, we've also recently released a survey to query the OCB community on how we can more equitably serve the oceanography community and what hot button issues we should include in this panel discussion. I'll post a link to that survey in the chat also so, so that you can take this survey if you haven't already. And we're also interested in having an environmental justice themed webinar focusing on marine biogeochemistry, marine ecosystem services, and, and climate issues that are relevant to OCB. We invite you to engage with the OCB network in the many ways listed here, our website, our e-newsletter, which only comes out every two weeks, um, a great compilation of resources for the community, and also please follow us on social media, both Twitter and YouTube. Um, you can always reach us at the email listed here. Uh, we're always checking that email. It goes to all of us in the project office. Just a quick screenshot on how to use WebEx in case this is your first time. Um, for sound, please note um, down here, um, this is the sound. Note that all the attendees are actually muted and your video is off just to reduce background noise and distraction. So I can unmute you, but you cannot unmute yourself. 
Um, you can find um, phone and dial-in information if you click on this dot, dot, dot. In case you're having any bandwidth issues and you just want to listen in on the phone and then watch the recording with the slides later, you can do that. This red X here will get you out of the webinar. So if you need to leave, that's where you go. Um, you can adjust the visual layout up here in the right hand corner. And then you can view participants as attendees. This will enable you to see all the panelists, but you will not be able to see the full list of attendees. Um, and then there's a chat function, which is what we are going to be using for the question and answer period today. So on the bottom right hand, I encourage you to keep this on. You can use this to ask questions of me as the host. I ask that you be mindful of the chat recipient of your question. So if you select host, the question only comes to me. If you select all panelists, it goes to the speakers, Julie and myself. If you select all participants, it will go to everyone on today's webinar. Um, our SSC co-host and I will be moderating the Q&A today. If we don't get to all your questions, we'll share them with a the speaker so they can follow up with you later. Uh, we will also use the chat to post references and other helpful information throughout the webinar. So I do recommend keeping it opened. So the theme of today's webinar is new insights on the marine nitrogen cycle. Today's speakers are Clara Fuchsman from the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science and Francisco Cervantes from National University of Mexico. Julie is going to introduce our first speaker, Clara. Oh, hi. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Clara Fuchsman, who will be talking to us about the quantification of the sources of organic material that foster nitrogen gas production in the ocean's oxygen minimum zones. So Dr. Clara Fuchsman is an assistant professor at Horn Point Laboratory, which is a field station of the University of Maryland. Uh, Clara got her PhD at the University of Washington working with Jim Murray and Jim uh, Staley and uh, working on the Black Sea and um, biogeochemical cycling therein. Her postdoc was with, with Aldeval and Gabrielle Rocap at the University of Washington, working on the Eastern Tropical North Pacific oxygen deficient zones. So currently, Clara works on the interface between chemical and biological oceanography. And Clara's pandemic hobby has been biking around the rural area that is Horn Point um, and taking photos of birds. And if you hear a joyful bird in the background, uh, Clara has a pet bird, so don't be alarmed. And um, yeah, move it over to Clara. Thank you. Hi. Today I'm going to be talking about uh, quantification of organic matter sources for nitrogen gas production in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific Oxygen Deficient Zone. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my co-authors, especially Michael Carlson, who's pictured here, who is a co-first author on this work, his advisor, Debbie Lindahl, and Megan Duffy, Rick Kyle, and Al Duvall, who are the uh, in-situ incubator sediment trap team at the University of Washington. So I'm going to start with our goal or motivation for this talk. So this is kind of a, a sneak peek. Um, we're going to show that viral lysis of cyanobacteria living in the oxygen deficient zone fuels N2 production. So here you can see a graph in, um, in green. You have chlorophyll. You can see there's two chlorophyll maxes. In black, it's oxygen. And the dashed line shows you in all of the whole talk at the top of the oxygen deficient zone. And in our second graph, you can see there's just a little bit of light irradiance that is getting into the top of the oxygen deficient zone and allowing this second chlorophyll maximum to occur. Okay, so that's your sneak peek. Let's get going. Okay, so the oxygen content of the ocean has decreased since the 1980s. Uh, here we have a graph showing the oxygen content of the global ocean, and in black, you can see uh, measurements of oxygen concentration. In red, it's oxygen saturation, so that's affected by temperature, and that hasn't changed very much. But um, in blue, you have the apparent oxygen utilization, so that's respiration. It appears that respiration has increased, 
oxygen concentration has gone down. But whatever the reason for this, it is affecting oxygen deficient zones. Oxygen deficient zones have expanded. So oxygen deficient zones are defined as less part of the water has less than 10 nanomolar oxygen. Here in this map, they're shown in dark blue. There's three of them in the ocean. It's about 1% of ocean volume. And today we're particularly looking at the Eastern Tropical North Pacific, which has a red circle around it. Um, the Eastern Tropical North Pacific oxygen deficient zone in particular has gotten shallower and deeper since the 1980s. So it's expanded vertically. And this is important when we're thinking about processes where the light entering the oxygen deficient zone is important. So presently, the secondary chlorophyll maximum is very common in the eastern tropical North Pacific. Here we have a map and all the red dots are stations that are anoxic that have a secondary chlorophyll max and the black dots are anoxic station with no secondary chlorophyll max. So you can see most of the black dots are in the north where the oxygen deficient zone is deeper. But what you can also see is that there are a lot of red dots here. I think there are many more red dots than there would have been in the 80s. Why do, you, why do we care about that? Well, oxygen deficient zones have a global impact on the nitrogen cycle. We have a very simple nitrogen cycle here, the simplest. Our inputs are nitrogen fixation, which creates nutrients. Nutrients are used, they're essential for phytoplankton and bacterial growth, and our output is nitrogen production. And 30 to 50% of marine nitrogen production occurs in oxygen deficient zones. So even though they're small volume, they're very important to the nitrogen cycle. Organic matter is necessary for N2 production, particularly in oxygen deficient zones. Both N2 production pathways, there's two, they need organic matter. So there's heterotrophic denitrification, and it's this is a heterotrophic process, so it's using organic carbon straight out and nitrate to make N2 gas. But there's also the Animox process, which, which is autotrophic, so it doesn't use organic carbon directly, but it uses ammonia and nitrite to make N2 gas. However, ammonia is quite limiting in the oxygen deficient zone. And if we look at the real equation for heterotrophic denitrification, can see that when the organic matter is um, decomposed, it creates ammonia. And so the Animox is using this ammonia. Thus, even though it's not directly using organic carbon, it's still linked to organic carbon fluxes. However, we just said that organic matter is really important for N2 production, but most of the Eastern Tropical North Pacific oxygen deficient zone is offshore, low chlorophyll, low productivity, low export as determined by sediment traps. So here's a map of satellite chlorophyll, the ETMP in the black, you see the edge of the oxygen deficient zone, at least according to World Ocean Atlas. And what you can see is that the majority of the oxygen deficient zone is offshore in blue water. But despite this low productivity and export in the offshore, Denitrifiers and Animox bacteria are present and active. So here we have one graph for Animox and one graph for denitrification. This is an offshore station. Um, in both graphs, the circles are rates, so the Animox and denitrification rates. And um, the red squares are the bacteria, depth profile of the bacteria according to metagenomics. So there, the rates are there and the organisms are there, but how do they have enough organic carbon to function? So there are at least three sources of organic matter for N2 producing bacteria. They're sinking flux from above. That is what people usually think about and it's what's used in models. We also have this in situ productivity. We have our secondary chlorophyll max that is, uh, exists in the, in the oxygen deficient zone. And there's also um, daily vertical migration of zooplankton that are avoiding predators. They migrate into the deep, actually, into the oxygen deficient zone. And I think this is very interesting, but we don't have a lot of quantitative data 
uh, for the carbon flux associated to this at this time. So we're going to be focusing on um, sinking fluxes and in situ productivity. Um, so if we identify what is causing the secondary chlorophyll max, the cyanobacteria prochlorococcus is the dominant photoautotroph in oxygen deficient zone. There we have flow, flow cytometry data. Um, you can see with the red arrow that there's a maximum of prochlorococcus in the oxygen deficient zone. There's a little bit of synecococcus, but the, um, the axis is actually order magnitude smaller than for prochlorococcus. And there's basically no photosynthetic PCO eukaryotes, at least from this method. So this prochlorococcus is creating organic matter in situ by photosynthesis. Um, here in our graph, we have for this particular station, the chlorophyll and the cell counts of prochlorococcus. Then using a carbon per cell ratio, um, which vary depending on the type of prochlorococcus, we can calculate how much organic carbon is in these prochlorococcus cells. We also, and that's in yellow, we also have um, the suspended particular organic carbon and particular organic nitrogen from the water column. So like the in situ measurements. And um, what you can see is that there's a maximum in the in situ measurements that corresponds to the maximum in prochlorococcus uh, carbon. And in fact, they're pretty much the same magnitude. But how do heterotrophic bacteria, we just showed that prochlorococcus is creating organic matter, but how do the heterotrophic bacteria get this organic carbon from the prochlorococcus? Prochlorococcus and denitrifiers, they're this, both bacteria, they're both the same size, and the denitrifiers are not predators. They're not killing the prochlorococcus. Pyrolysis provides a way for bacteria to get organic matter from autotrophs. So in this, uh, picture here, the autotroph is in green, and if it gets eaten by grazers, that carbon is going up the trophic levels, which is great for fish, but really bad for denitrifiers. However, if the autotroph gets killed by a virus, it lyses, and so then it creates dissolved organic matter and small particulate organic matter. And these can be taken up by heterotrophic bacteria in an in the oxygen deficient zone, these heterotrophs are denitrifiers. So the questions we want to address in this talk are, how much organic matter is being liberated by viral infection of prochlorococcus in the oxygen deficient zone? How much denitrification can this organic matter support? And how does this calculated denitrification compare to measure rates? Um, so Michael Carlson and Debbie Lindell have created a method for counting infected cyanobacteria. Um, and in this method, it starts by sorting the cyanobacteria or the whole community with flow cytometry. And I just want to note that you can this technique is only can be only be used on the free living community, and so um, we can't look at particles in this way. So we're only looking at free living organisms. Okay, so what's happening here is you sort the prochlorococcus, both those infected by viruses and not infected by viruses into one tube. And you take this tube and you embed it into a gel. So you have the prochlorococcus in a gel. And you do a solid state PCR for viruses in this gel. And so then the viruses here are they glow with fluorescent probe. Basically, you're doing a PCR and then hybridizing with a fluorescent probe. So from this, we can get the percent infection of these prochlorococcus, because you know how much prochlorococcus you started with, and then you can see how many viruses are there. So we get about 2% of the prochlorococcus are infected in the oxygen deficiency. Here we have graphs from two different stations, P1 and P2. Um, and in yellow and gray are two different big different types of viruses that affect prochlorococcus. But for this talk, we're just going to add them together and um, into a total infected cells of prochlorococcus, which is in black. 
you can see it, it's fairly similar between these two stations. So how much carbon is released from virally infected prochlorococcus? Um, the equation for this is actually quite simple. We have the number of infected cells. So we just got that from cell sorting and pollinies. That's the name of technique. Um, next, we have a carbon per cell. So we have this from two different ways. One is from cultures, and the other is flow cytometry of our data, and they both agree. So we feel good about that one. And then we have lysis per day. So this is how fast does a virus kill a cell? And this is pretty important, but um, unfortunately, none of the oxygen deficient zone viruses are cultured. So we don't actually know how long it takes them to kill a cell. So we're going to estimate that two different ways. So we're estimating the time from infection until lysis. And this is called the latent period. So the latent period for cultured viruses infecting prochlorococcus ranges from four to 10 hours. However, these cultured viruses are mostly from surface waters. And while prochlorococcus and surface waters are doubling once per day, deep prochlorococcus, like we're talking about in the oxygen deficient zone are doubling once per week. So this is really quite different. Um, so if we're here, if we assume that the doubling time and the latent period are linked, then latent period could be 56 to seven hours. This is a long time. So this is our conservative estimate. I don't really think that it's gonna be this long. So our second estimate is if we assume that growth equals death, a steady state assumption, and we allow about 10% of the death to be by grazing, which comes from the literature, and 90% of the death to be from viruses, then we get a viral latent period that's about 32 hours. Okay, so, but here we're just gonna, we don't know what the latent period is, so we're gonna calculate for all the, all the latent periods. So in this graph that's on the x-axis is just a whole bunch of latent periods, and then we have on the y-axis, the nanomolar per day carbon released. And what you can see is that we've marked both our conservative estimate, which is this gray box, and then also our steady state estimate. So let's put this into context. What do these, what do these numbers mean? So let's compare to the sinking organic carbon. We have, uh -uh, have sediment traps. You can see a picture of the sediment trap here. And in this graph, the sediment trap fluxes are the, the black circles. You can see the sediment trap fluxes, they go down with depth, but then they really level off. In blue, I've calculated the attenuation of the sediment flux. So how much organic carbon is lost while it's sinking through the oxygen deficient zone. And so that's the blue bar here. Then in gray, we have the organic carbon released from viral lysis with a latent period of 72 hours. That's our conservative estimate. And the gray and the orange together, we have organic carbon released from viral lysis with a 36 hour latent period. So you can see that this prochlorococcus, this infected prochlorococcus, have the potential to be adding a lot of organic carbon to the system. Okay, so now all we're doing here is changing our calculation from organic carbon to denitrification rates. And so this is exactly the same graph, except for stoichiometrically, we've changed the units from carbon to nanomolar nitrogen per day of nitrogen gas. Okay. So now that we have these calculated rates, how do these calculated denitrification rates compare to our measured rates? And I think the way that we've measured rates on this cruise is really pretty cool. We have rates from sediment trap incubators. So our rates are occurring inside inside the oxygen deficient zone. First, the trap gets set out and sits in anoxic waters. 
for about eight hours. And this is to remove trace oxygen because oxygen will stick to parts of just the material. Then the bottom of the sediment trap closes and you collect particles for 12 hours. Then the top of the incubation chamber closes and this control bottle, which is really a water column bottle. Um, they close in their syringes with N15 nitrate that inject into both of these chambers. So you get a water column rate and then a rate plus particles. And then while this is incubating, the top of the sediment trap is collecting material for, for our fluxes. Okay, so here are our measured N2 production rates from this in-situ incubator. In the water column, so that's kind of the control bottle, you can see um, there's a maximum in the rates of at 110 meters. And these rates are actually quite high at the 110 meters of 20 nanomolar per day. On the other graph, we see rates from particulate, the particulate organic matter, so the sediment trap rates. These aren't our original rates. As measured, those are quite high. These are rates after accounting for the fact that the organic matter was concentrated in the sediment trap for 12 hours. So we use sinking rate of organic matter to back calculate what the rates would be in one liter of water. And we have duplicate traps here. So these error bars are from duplicate traps. And that's part of the reason why they're so big because especially in 100 meters, because um, there's heterogeneity in particle flux. Okay, so let's compare these measured rates from our calculated rates. So first, we have a graph here that is the amount of organic carbon in infected prochlorococcus. So that's in yellow. So before it was total prochlorococcus, now it's carbon in infected prochlorococcus. So that's our carbon source. And then on the next graph, we have our measured rates in red. So those are the same as on the previous graph. See this slide. We also have our um, calculated denitrification rates from, in green, we have viral lysis from a latent period of 36 hours. And in blue, we have our conservative estimate of uh, N2 production from organic carbon from viral lysis with a latent period of 72 hours. So what you can see here is that they all have a maximum, even the measured rates have a maximum where we have this uh, maximum in infected prochlorococcus cells. And we're gonna do one more calculation here. Okay, so what we're now calculating is water column only rates because in our control bottle, we have our free living bacteria that are being affected by um, the dissolved organic matter created by viral lysis, but we also have whatever particles got caught in that container while they are sinking through the water column. So we, but we've calculated these particle associated N2 production rates. So we can use our water column rates, subtract the particle associated rates to get water column only rates. And so that is now what we're showing in red, the water column only rates. And you can see that uh, the water column only rates and the viral lysis, uh, the rates from organic matter from viral lysis so the latent period of 36 hours, they match really closely except for 100 meters. And what I think is happening at 100 meters is that um, there's still a lot of nitrite oxidation going on there because prochlorococcus is actually creating a little bits of oxygen in the oxygen decision zone and the nitrite oxidizers can use this. So what you have is your organic matter is being used in nitrate reduction to nitrite, but then the nitrite oxidizers are taking that nitrate and bringing it back to nitrate. And so it's very inefficient from organic matter point of view. The organic matter is not being used to all the way to N2 production. I've also included nitrite, uh, a graph of nitrite on this a slide because a lot of people who work in oxygen efficient zones really like to see a nitrite profile. And this is all happening above the nitrite maximum. So in summary, the Eastern Tribal and North Pacific Oxygen Deficient Zone has shoaled over time. 
increasing the habitat for oxygen deficient zone adapted Prochlorococcus and its viruses. The viral lysis of oxygen deficient zone Prochlorococcus has the potential to add significant amounts of organic matter to the upper oxygen deficient zone. And the amount of organic carbon released depends on the latent period of the virus, which is difficult or impossible to measure in situ. So we really need to culture them. Um, but if all the organic matter from lice prochlorococcus contributed to N2 production, it could fuel the entire water column only rates in the upper oxygen deficient zone. Okay, so now let's think about this in a really big picture way. Um, Curtis Deutsch published a paper way back in 2004 um, with a feedback loop that keeps N2 production from in balance. Basically, the idea is that when oxygen deficient zones get larger, there's more N2 production, and N2 production comes from nitrate, so there's less nitrate. There's less nitrate in surface waters, that means there's less productivity, and less productivity means less organic carbon flux, and less organic carbon flux is less N2 production. So it keeps the situation basically in balance. However, the assumption under this feedback loop is that the organic carbon flux is from surface waters where nutrients are limiting. But we just were talking about how in the ETMP, primary production within the oxygen deficient zone occurs, and this should allow nitrogen loss from the oxygen deficient zones to continue despite surface limitation. This is particularly important because while climate, the same climate forcing that causes denitrification to increase also causes the amount of oxygen deficient zone prochlorococcus to increase because there's more area where the ODZ prochlorococcus can live. That means that instead of having denitrification being countered by less productivity, as denitrification increases, there's actually more productivity also increasing at the same time. And I think at least in the Eastern Tropical North Pacific, where this oxygen deficient zone prochlorococcus is very common, I think that models need to be including this process to really understand what is gonna happen in the future. Thank you. <clears throat> thank, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Heather. Oh, I was just going to say thank you, Clara, and I, I welcome questions. Julie and I will be happy to moderate your questions. Please enter them into the chat, either to everyone or to all panelists, just to make sure we're seeing them. Okay. Mike Siraki has asked a question. Are these prochlorococcus present in other oxygen deficient zones? Uh, they are present in other oxygen deficient zones. However, they may not be as abundant. Like they're definitely present in, well, they're definitely present in both the ETSP and the Arabian Sea. In the ETSP, they are less common. Um, but also the ETSP isn't as oligotrophic as the ETMP. So I still think they are important, but they're not as important on the same level. Let's see. Greg Cutter asks, viral lysis affects the prochlorococcus in the upper chlorophyll maximum too. Does this affect carbon budget and heterotrophs? Uh, probably, yes, but I haven't looked, we can't define that quite as well. Um, but you have to remember that in the upper chlorophyll max, there's also lots of eukaryotes present. So viralysis is important everywhere. So it's important to the prochlorococcus there, but it, it's also important for the um, eukaryotic algae that are at the primary chlorophyll max. 
Another question, do all viruses in Prochlorococcus kill them? Any virus living happily together with Prochlorococcus? <laughs> uh, it is true that we are assuming that the viruses are gonna kill the Prochlorococcus. And it is also true that there are uh, defense mechanisms that all sorts of different bacteria, including Prochlorococcus have, so that not every viral infection um, leads to death. You wanna note mm -hmm. that the, the viruses are already inside the cell for our analysis. Like um, we know that they're inside the cell. So that's our, they've already um, passed several of the stages of where the Prochlorococcus can defend against them, but um, it is overestimate, but that is all we can do at the moment. And I realized I over I missed a question, um, an earlier question from Bess Ward asking, which you might have already addressed, asking about the Eastern Tropical South Pacific, where there's usually not a prominent deep chlorophyll max. Yeah, there is. I mean, sometimes there is, but it is also smaller. The Eastern Tropical North Pacific has a much bigger chlorophyll max when it when it's seen most of the time. Um, but this is because the Eastern Tropical North Pacific is more oligotrophic. So there's more light because the light, there's two reasons why light can get into the oxygen deficient zone. One has to do with how shallow the oxygen deficient zone is, but the other has to do with the shading. How many other phototrophic organisms are in the surface waters or you know, top 50 meters or whatever. And um, in the Eastern Tropical South Pacific, there's more productivity in surface water, so the light isn't um, going as deep. But it also means that there's more of the normal type of flux coming from surface waters. Thank you, Clara. We have a couple more, but I'm going to send them to you privately because we need to move on now. But thank you all for your questions. I will make sure there are three more questions that have come in, and I will make sure that that Clara receives these and can follow up with you individually. Um, just wanna remind all you participants out there to please use either everyone or all panelists as the recipient of your questions because a lot of them are coming just to me and I want other people to be able to see them, um, including our hosts or, our, or our, my co-host and, and, and speakers. So I'm gonna let Julie introduce our next speaker, Francisco, while I transfer the speaker role to him. Um, yeah, it is my pleasure for the second talk to introduce Francisco Cervantes from the National University of Mexico, who will talk to us about novel microbial processes that interconnect, interconnect global biogeochemical cycles in the marine environment. Uh, so Francisco obtained his PhD in environmental sciences from the Department of Environmental Technology at Bargeninger University in the Netherlands. Um, he was then uh, became an associate professor at the Department of Water and Environmental Science in, at Itzon in Mexico until 2006. Was then a professor at the Division of Environmental Sciences I, IP, um, IPC Mexico um, until April 2019. From August 2011 to 2012, he was also appointed professor in the Department of Biotechnology in Trondheim in Norway. Uh, recently, he got a professor position of engineering at, at the Engineering Institute of UNAM, so at the National University of Mexico. Uh, Francisco is a member of the editorial board of Reviews in Environmental Sciences and Biotechnology, and, as well as an associated editor for EWA Publishing. He's received several distinctions in his career, including the prestigious Lendiga Award in 2007, um, and the National Research Award in 2008 in Engineering and Technology from the Mexican Academy of Sciences, and the Marcos Moschinsky Fellow. Uh, fellow, he is a sorry, the Marcos uh, Moschinsky Fellow. So, during the pandemic, Francisco's uh, new hobby has become um, he has become an expert at preparing pizza and ice cream at home. So, um, it is again my pleasure to introduce. Francisco Cervantes, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, for your nice uh, introduction. Um, 
Um, so I'm now sharing my screen to you. So So here we go. So uh, I'm excited to share with you this talk. So I thank the organizers for inviting me to, to give this webinar. So the title of my presentation is Novel Microbial Processes Potentially Interconnecting Global Biogeochemical Cycles in Marine Environments. And uh, I will start by saying that within the marine nitrogen cycle, as you know, uh, most reactions are uh, driven by uh, microbial processes. So you have microorganisms uh, responsible for uh, fixing all the atmospheric nitrogen to create all this uh, organic nitrogen pool in the, uh, in the oceans. And on the other hand, you have this uh, nitrification and denitrification processes combined to get all this uh, nitrogen back to the atmosphere. Lately, uh, anamox, that is the anaerobic ammonium oxidation, in which ammonium is oxidized with a nitride as terminal electron acceptor has been reported also as a major player uh, on the nitrogen loss in, in marine environments. <clears throat> so we have a tight uh, nitro nitrogen balance in, in, the, in the oceans because the nitrogen fixation rates uh, average between 100 and 200 teragrams of nitrogen a year. And on the other hand, it, it, there is an estimation of nitrogen loss driven by denitrification uh, with a value of two, 200 teragrams fixed nitrogen a year. And lately, Anamox uh, uh, has been studied and uh, has been uh, pointed as responsible for up to 40% of this nitrogen loss in the oceans. So uh, basically, we have denitrification uh, anamox um, as the only recognized microbial processes driving nitrogen loss in marine environments so far. But anamox is thermodynamically feasible with other, uh, other uh, environmentally relevant electron acceptors, uh, particularly with uh, ferric iron and uh, sulfate, because these reactions are also thermodynamically feasible with a delta G, a negative uh, delta G. So what is relevant for the sulfate-dependent anamox, which uh, we call the sulfamox, is because sulfate is the most abundant uh, electron acceptor available in the oceans. And there are actually several reports of the sulfamox process already described in wastewater treatment processes in artificial environments. But the question is, if are there microorganisms in marine environments performing this uh, sulfamox process in nature? because this process has remained elusive in previous studies. And regarding the FAMOX process, that is the uh, ferric iron dependent anamox, uh, is relevant because marine sediments with amorphous forms of uh, iron oxides have the potential uh, to support the FAMOX process. And this FAMOX process actually has been reported in other environments, uh, such as uh, uh, wetland sediments and paddy soils. Uh, but there are no reports so far that microorganisms in marine environments are able to perform this uh, uh, FAMOX process. So we uh, conducted some marine sediment incubations. Uh, to explore these sulfamox and fiamox processes. These uh, coastal marine sediments were collected from Baja California and Sinaloa states located in the northwest of Mexico, uh, which is actually part of the major oxygen deficient zone in the eastern tropical North Pacific. So these are two nice pictures of the sampling points of uh, Baja California and uh, Sinaloa. So to, to perform these sediment incubations, uh, we created these microcosms uh, under at argon atmosphere. Uh, we prepared artificial marine medium and inoculated uh, the bowl with uh, 10 grams per liter of sediment. So the incubation temperature was uh, 28 Celsius, which is actually the average temperature in the sample site. So we used either label ammonia or unlabeled ammonia to provide us a only electron donor in this in the incubations. We also prepared um, 
a control in which this uh, artificial marine medium was not provided with any uh, electron acceptor. And also, when we explore the Thiamox process, we provided the medium with a ferric hydrate as a terminal electron acceptor. The analysis we conducted uh, includes uh, colorimet colorimetric methods to measure ammonia, uh, sulfate, sulfate and ferrous iron concentrations. We also use Raman spectroscopy and XRD to identify uh, key intermediates and final mineral products uh, during the course of sulfamox and thiamox processes. We quantified the production of uh, nitrogen when we used uh, label ammonia by GCMS, and we also uh, performed a taxonomic characterization based on 16S RNA gene sequencing. So these are the, the main results we got uh, regarding the sulfamox process. Uh, this is uh, results coming out from the incubation with sediment from Baja California. We observed uh, a rapid uh, ammonium uh, oxidation in the course of uh, three days of uh, incubation. So we see here uh, that also the control uh, not provided with external electron acceptor also um, uh, showed a, 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 a significant amount of ammonium oxidation due to the presence of intrinsic electron acceptor present on the pore water of the, of the sediment. Uh, and if we want to quantify the amount of sulfide coming out from the sulfate production, we were not able to get a stoichiometric evidence to explain this ammonium oxidation, because especially during the first hours of the incubations, you can see here that uh, uh, just uh, a little of sulfide was uh, detected. And this is because uh, sulfide, uh, under the conditions we performed experiments, precipitated uh, a large fraction of this uh, produced sulfide was precipitated in, in the form of several minerals, including esphalerite that is shown here on the XRD diffractogram. So, and we also observe accumulation of elemental sulfur. So we got evidence by Raman spectroscopy that also elemental sulfur is produced out of uh, sulfate reduction during the course of the sul uh, sulfamox process. So this is a nice uh, scanning electron microscopy showing these pre uh, precipitants uh, in, the, in, the, in the marine sediment incubation. Um, but uh, th this was a little bit disappointed to not to get a, a, a good evidence based on the sulfide concentration, but luckily, uh, based on the sulfate and ammonium concentration, uh, if you take into account the stoichiometric uh, value, the theoretical ratio of ammonium oxidized and sulfate reduced is 2.66. So, uh, according to this uh, data we, we got uh, on the sulfate um, concentration, we got a very similar uh, ratio both in both cases. When we get only the sulfide present naturally on the pore water of, of the sediments, and also by adding external sulfate by these artificial marine sediments. So that means that we have a very good uh, electron balance here. Uh, between 95 and 97 percent of electron balance, which uh, is a good indication that ammonium oxidation is coupled to sulfate reduction in our incubations. So we uh, did uh, additional incubations with label ammonia just to quantify the production of uh, nitrogen coming out from the sulfate uh, su su Sulfamox uh, process. Uh, so you can see here significant uh, nitrogen production, uh, ranging uh, almost five micrograms of uh, nitrogen per gram of sediment per day. And also, uh, very important to emphasize here that the control inhibited by molybdate, which is a selective inhibitor for sulfate reduction, uh, did not show any uh, nitrogen production. So that's another indication that ammonium oxidation depends on the reduction of sulfate. So regarding the FEMOX process, we observe this uh, parallel ammonium oxidation coupled to the production of uh, ferrous iron in incubation 
incubations performed with the sediments coming out from Baja California and from Sinaloa. And quantification of this ferrous iron uh, accounted for up to 57% of the oxidized ammonium. Of course, an important fraction of this ferrous iron was also precipitated in the sediment, so that's why it's relatively low uh, electron balance we got here in our incubations. For instance, this wistite mineral was precipitated and detected by XRD diffractograms in our experiment. Um, also, additional incubations with uh, label ammonia indicated this, that this um, FIAMOX process uh, produces nitrogen uh, at a range similar to the FIAMOX activities reported in terrestrial environments. So about 1.5 micrograms of nitrogen per gram per day was observed in these incubations with the sediment from Baja California. Um, now, uh, regarding this taxonomic characterization based on uh, 16S RNA gen uh, gene sequencing, um, I will try uh, to summarize and pronounce these uh, difficult names. But basically, we have, uh, during the course of sulfamox process, we got an enrichment of uh, bacteria belonging to the fam families Physisphariasia. Muribaculacea and Rhodobacteracea for the case of Baja California sediments. And for the case of the sediment from Sinaloa, several bacteria belonging to the families Pseudocardiacea, Egertalacea, Anerolinacea, and Fibrobacteracea were also enriched uh, uh, in these uh, sediment incubations. And regarding archaeal uh, enrichment, we didn't observe any enrichments uh, in incubations performed with uh, the sediment, sediment from uh, Sinaloa. And regarding uh, incubations performed with uh, the sediment from Baja California, uh, two uh, families were enriched, and that is uh, the sulfurococacacea and thermoplasmatacea. And that was about the sulfamox process. And regarding the FEAMOX process, we uh, observed an enrichment of several families belonging to the actinobacteria filum in the case of the sediment from Baja California. And for the case of uh, Sinaloa sediment, uh, only one family wa was enriched, that is Egertelasia. And uh, from the archaeal part, uh, Nitrosopumilacea was uh, observed and enriched in both sediments, and Batiarchiasia was also enriched uh, in the sediment from Sinaloa. So with these uh, initial findings, we have a very nice and interesting interconnections between the nitrogen, sulfur, and iron cycles, because as you know, uh, denitrification uh, can be supported I mean, autotrophic denitrification uh, can be supported by the oxidation of sulfide or ferrous, ferrous iron. And in this case, this sulfide oxidation leads to the production of sulfates, which in turn can support the sulfamox process connected to the oxidation of ammonia. And regarding this ferrous iron, which is oxidized to ferric iron through autotrophic denitrification. This ferric iron can support the FEAMOX process. And in this way, we have a very nice connection between the iron and the nitrogen cycle here as well. We were also wondering if uh, humic substances could also support anaerobic ammonium oxidation, but by serving as terminal electron acceptors, because humic substances uh, you may recall that uh, they are produced uh, through several biochemical and bioabiotic reactions taking place in sediments and soils. And so they produce uh, complex and heterogeneous materials, so-called humic substances. And these humic substances are quite stable so that the, the uh, mean residence times is several centuries. That means this humification process represents um, a good mechanism, an important mechanism 
to um, prevent the release of an important amount of CO2 to the atmosphere. But even though this humic material is, is quite stable, uh, within its structure contains redox active uh, functional groups that can accept electrons through abiotic and microbial reactions. So you see here how quinones can be reduced to the hydroquinone counterpart um, and, and then um, reoxidize to the quinone group. Uh, by several reactions. So this is a nice uh, report by Derek Lovely and co-workers in which they report that this geobacter species is actually able to oxidize acetate and some other simple organic substrates coupled to the microbial reduction of humic substances. So this was the first report of humic substances actually serving as terminal electron receptor. So the question here is if humic substances can sustain the anamox process, because at least thermodynamically, if we take into account the redox potential of humic substances that you can find in nature, which uh, ranges uh, minus 300 millivolts to 150 millivolts, that is positive. So in most of this um, redox potential range, you have uh, a negative delta G, meaning that this anamox process connected to the reduction of na natural organic matter, specifically humic substances, is a feasible process in nature. And uh, why humic substances would be relevant in, in, in marine environments? Because humic substances comprise a major fraction of natural organic matter in the oceans, and which uh, re actually represents one of the largest carbon pools on Earth with uh, more than 600 petagrams uh, of carbon. And also the average residence time of humic substances in the oceans is millionaire, as you can see here. So we performed these additional incubations in which we observe the simultaneous oxidation of ammonia coupled to the reduction of natural organic matter. And not only natural organic matter intrinsically present in the marine sediment, but also external humic substances that we added in the form of pakhoki peat humic substances. And these uh, actually, these uh, humic substances contain quinoid meiotis that we, uh, through this infrared spectroscopy, we were able to document the reduction of these uh, quinone groups to the corresponding phenolic groups during the course of this anamox process connected to the reduction of uh, humic substances. And if we come up with the quantitative evidence uh, by quantifying this uh, reduction of, of the quinones in the humic substances, we found 87% uh, to 99% of the electrons originated from ammonium oxidation uh, recovered as a reduced natural organic matter, which is a very nice evidence that anamox is coupled to the reduction of the natural organic matter. And additional incubations performed with the uh, uh, label ammonia. And in this way, we, we got an evidence of the nitrogen production rate, uh, not only with the natural organic matter present in the, in the sediment of Baja California here, uh, and in which we have a, a production rate of 0 0.4 micrograms of nitrogen per gram per day. And with external geomic substances, in the form of Pakhoki beads, then we observe a production rate of 1.5 micrograms of nitrogen per gram per day. And regarding this uh, phylogenetic characterization, we observed an enrichment. This is the bacterial families enriched during the uh, anamox process connected to the reduction of humic substances. So mainly Physis fariacea and Mora Moraxelasia were enriched in incubations with sediments from Baja California and with sediment from Sinaloa, we have a very large enrichment of Rhodobacteracea, Fibrobacteracea, Irelinilasia, and some others. But what was really interesting is from the archaeal families, Nitrosopumilasia was enriched really in a, in a large proportion, like 80% a proportion of increase in the case of Baja California sediment. 
So we think this is an initial indication in which we have a new interconnection, interconnection between the carbon and nitrogen cycles in the oceans, uh, connecting the ammonium oxidation coupled to the reduction of natural organic matter by microorganisms in marine sediments. In, in a similar fashion, we uh, made additional incubations to perform this anaerobic methane oxidation uh, coupled to the reduction of nitrous oxide by uh, microorganisms present in coastal wetland sediments in, in the Yucatan Peninsula in, in, in Mexico. So we got uh, evidence here that uh, nitrous oxide uh, reduction is connected to the production of CO2 uh, coming out from the methane oxidation here, and this uh, nitrous oxide reduction actually accounts for 43% of the methane oxidized and quantified as CO2 here. So with this, I come to my conclusion. So uh, I think I, I presented the first evidence showing that microbes present in marine sediments can perform this anamox process linked to alternative electron acceptors, including sulfate, ferric iron, and natural organic matter, which are relevant, especially in, in, in the sediments. So they show significant nat nitrogen loss by these microbial processes. And I think uh, this novel uh, pathways potentially uh, interconnect the oceanic and biogeochemical cycles of nitrogen, sulfur, iron, and even carbon. So I'm, I'm going to thank, thank my PhD students and master's students, especially Emilia Rios, uh, who did most of the experiments I, I show you today here, and some other colleagues uh, that uh, also collaborate in, in these studies. Here are my contact uh, details, so my email, my Twitter account. So I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Francisco. Please enter your questions in the chat. Any evidence for sulfamox in the water column? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question. Uh, uh, we haven't um, performed experiments in situ, but, uh, but I'm sure, uh, I mean, I, I've, I have a, a high expectation that uh, uh, sulfamox is feasible not only in, in sedimentary environment, but probably in pelagic uh, and, uh, in the water column, but uh, we don't have any evidence on that yet. Okay. From, oh, wait a second. We've got a lot of questions coming in. Okay. Um, what, what do you think is mediating the difference in the microbial community leading the chemical process from both locations? Was the over low overlap expected? Well, uh, I'm not an expert on uh, phylogenetic characterization, but I think uh, uh, we observed a, a little bit of difference uh, when we made the characterization of the sediment and the, and the, and the, and the pore water of the, of the sites. We observed uh, a difference. What it could also make a difference is the the sediment collected in Sinaloa was polluted by uh, discharge of aquaculture activity there, which I think uh, makes a, a big difference on, on the levels of nitrogen found on that particular site. Okay. For the ammonium oxidation coupled with natural organic matter reduction, how would you expect the absolute amount of carbon in the natural organic matter to change, to decrease? And if so, in what forms? Well, actually, uh, uh, as I said in, in the introduction of this process, geomic substances are quite stable. So that means, uh, of course, this uh, natural organic matter uh, contains a label fraction to support the heterotrophic activity in the sediment. But talking about the geomic substances, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a recalcitrant fraction that you couldn't expect to be degraded, but rather to act just as a, a, an electron shuttle not rather, uh, not like a uh, carbon uh, substrate, you know. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and then I will forward you the rest of these questions so that you can answer them separately. 
Sure. It, yeah. Is nitrite also produced by sulfamox similar to phaomox? Anamox no. take advantage of the produced nitrite and thrive. Right. That is uh, an, a very interesting question. We did, did not observe uh, any production of nitrates in any of the three processes I described today, sulfamox, phaomox, and uh, anamox connected to natural organic matter. Uh, reduction. So uh, basically, no nitrate, uh, at least it was not detected. So I, I believe there is a cryptic cycle going on there, which are, we are very interested on, on following up. All right. Well, with that, I will be sure that you get the rest of these questions. There are two or three more here for you. Francisco, um, we're coming up at five past the hour, so I want to let everybody get back to their busy Zoom lives. Um, but I want to thank everybody for joining us and especially thank our speakers and my co host today for really exciting and engaging talks. Some really exciting new results today. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'll see you all again on November 3rd. And for those of you in the United States, please get yourselves to the polls that day. Thank you.